Aaron, thank you so much for joining me here at LSI. Nick, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Tell me a little bit about Luminate Medical. So at Luminate, we're building devices which help cancer patients to prevent the side effects of cancer treatment, things like hair loss, neuropathy, even infertility. Um, so starting off with hair loss, we've built our first product, which is Lily. It's a portable, wearable device that allows patients to prevent the hair loss caused by chemotherapy. And the innovation that we've got there is we've created a new technology approach which allows us to do many of the same benefits of existing technologies in terms of efficacy, but we're able to solve some of the operational challenges in scaling those technologies up by creating a truly consumer-oriented wearable device that allows the patient to control the treatment and for them to fit in and fit out of an infusion clinic in the same way that they would at the moment without receiving any additional treatment. So the vision is to create a, a treatment for the side effects of cancer treatment like hair loss that's just as easy as, as buying a wig. It's fascinating. We'll take it sequentially then and we'll start with Lily. Tell us a little bit more about the technology. Yeah, for sure. So we've developed a new compression-based technology to try and solve the problem of unintended drug delivery to the hair follicles during chemotherapy treatment. So this is obviously um, not a new field. There are a lot of technologies that are out there that are giving patients some, some really good outcomes. But there's been some challenges in terms of scaling those and making that type of technology available to uh, patients both kind of even in larger academic centers but particularly in the community um, and so we've looked at what are the challenges with actually trying to scale in this space and it seems like at the moment a lot of them are linked to um, some pretty simple operational issues so with existing um, cooling devices you've got to get a large piece of infrastructure and, and house that in a hospital and the patient has to be connected to it uh, it means that they're spending longer in hospital um, and so what we've created is a portable wearable cap that's truly consumer oriented that takes out the need for that kind of expensive and bulky cryogenic technology um, and delivers the same effect uh, but ultimately allows the patient to uh, slip in and slip out of a chemotherapy clinic as they would normally. So the, the value prop is really clinics can continue to operate the way that they've always operated, but add this layer on top of patient quality of life services. That's great. So this is different from traditional cold cap therapy then? Yeah, exactly. And it's not that I suppose we've, we've seen with cold cap technology that there's been some great outcomes um, and we really want to continue that um, vein of having good efficacy for patients um, and for us the focus is on okay how can we one make that more consistent for patients and um, try and get over those hurdles and then two how can we make it scalable so that every patient can access this um, and not have the decision maybe taken out of their hands because the hospital can't physically scale the requirements of running a, a cooling system. So there's no cooling system involved in this at all? From the pictures I've seen of the device, it looks like it's just the wearable cap. Exactly that. So it's just a wearable cap. The patient is able to take it home with them after they've finished any individual chemotherapy treatment and bring it back in the next day for their infusion treatment. Um, so we've developed a new compression therapy-based protocol that allows that. So we can deliver all of the benefits of cooling in terms of preventing that off-target drug delivery, but take away some of those operational challenges and improve the consistency of the treatment too. Are you able to explain how you've kind of miniaturized that, uh, the cryo component of cooling therapy? There's usually, uh, for lack of better description, some tubing that runs into the cap that goes to a, de a device, the, the cryo source, I imagine. Forgive my uh, lack of complete understanding of the technology, but they have to then have that with them. How have you condensed all that into just a headpiece? So again, our focus has been, okay, what can we take about cryogenic technology um, and maybe find a new way to do that? So the key mechanism of action that we're looking at here is reducing um, blood perfusion around the hair follicle during chemotherapy treatment and for a period afterwards while the treatment is active in the body. Um, so what we're trying to do is make sure that less drug is actually delivered to the hair follicle in the first place. And then when it's there, some second order mechanisms like less oxygen for it to react with as well. 
Um, so how can we do that? And what we've developed is um, a new way of going after that with a compression therapy based protocol, which allows us to get very similar results in terms of perfusion reduction, um, a little bit more consistently in what we've seen in our data to date, which is exciting. Um, and ultimately, that's what's allowing us to, to miniaturize this treatment because we've gone from uh, requiring cryogenic uh, equipment, which as you've seen, there's been a lot of innovation, but it's still um, quite a, a a large piece of physical machinery that you've got to um, use to be able to, to create that effect. Whereas this is with a compression-based um, therapy, you can use micro pumps that could use in our device that are based on piezoelectronics that make it really simple to integrate into a wearable device that can be very consumer oriented. I know that it's pretty expensive actually for patients to get access to cold cap therapy uh, traditionally, so to say. Is this going to be an issue with your device or has the miniaturization and the technological advances that you're implementing made it also an accessible device? Yeah, so there's a few components to this. One is obviously from a technology perspective, we think we can be very competitive in terms of what our cost of goods is going to be. Um, but actually, I think one of the real uh, barriers to accessibility is where the decision gets taken out of the patient's hands by the, the hospital system. And if you look at it from their perspective, it makes a lot of sense. So uh, if I'm a hospital system and I'm treating somebody with a, a cooling device, obviously I want to provide that quality of life benefit to my patients. Um, but ultimately, that means that that patient is going to be in that infusion bay for two, three, four hours longer than they would be otherwise. Um, so that means that for that infusion bay that day, I'm treating maybe half as many patients as they would be otherwise. So if I'm a you know 250 seater infusion center, I might buy two cooling devices, but be treating 250 uh, patients that day because I can't simply you know take on the revenue loss. Let's say for a US-based healthcare system, or let's say if you're in Europe, you're you're going to really extend your waiting list um, to get into uh, a treatment list. So. Those are the real challenges with access, where the decision gets taken out of the patient's hands because it's not operationally possible for a hospital to offer it to all of their patients. And so with our technology, what we're trying to create is something that seamlessly fits into the way these clinics operate, um, allows them to do what they've always been doing, um, and ultimately we'll have a, a much higher percentage of that 250-seater infusion center uh, with patients who are getting access to best-in-class quality-of-life treatment. Yeah, that is incredible that your technology, one, addresses limitations of current technology and maybe the transportability of it, how patients can get access to it. It also is more affordable and you're increasing volume in those infusion centers. So ultimately more patients are being uh, treated, which is, that's fantastic. Let's maybe shift gears a little bit and talk a bit about LILAC, which you mentioned is for the treatment of peripheral neuropathy due, induced by chemotherapy. Yeah, so this is a really exciting project for us. We announced last um, November. Um, so for us, there's always been an ambition to, I suppose, be uh, the company which is going to provide uh, quality of life services for patients as they go through their cancer journey. So we want to build the tools that will help people to not just survive cancer treatment, but to live because no one wants to just be a, a survivor. Um, and so LILAC is our kind of first um, step on that pathway to expanding that portfolio of products. Um, it works in a very similar clinical mechanism um, to the Lilly device. We've seen some really interesting results in literature from some early phase studies that are happening around the world with types of technologies that are somewhat similar. And so we think we can apply a lot of the learning that we've had from the, the Lilly concept there too. Um, so for us, it's a, an early stage pipeline project at the moment. Um, our aim is to introduce it to the U.S. market in 2026. So we're looking at an FDA breakthrough designation um, in the near term future. We're looking at hopefully progressing that into clinical data at some point in the near term future. Um, but for us, it's a really exciting innovation project at the moment where we can take a lot of what we've learned um, in our Lilly device and a lot of crossover in terms of those technologies um, and go after um, a kind of human factors engineering ergonomics challenge um, that allows us to make a big difference for patients. Um, and I guess the last thing that really excites um, me about this particular need is we think of um, all of the costs that get sunk into healthcare, uh, particularly in the US, um, in cancer care. 
neuropathy is a massive example of that. So you have in the first nine months post chemo treatment, um, it's going to cost the hospital $17,000 per incidence of neuropathy in the follow-up appointments and the medication um, and all of the work that they have to do to support patients uh, through that. So there's a massive opportunity to improve patient quality of life, improve their outcomes, but also just try and sink some of that cost out of healthcare um, and make it more efficient. Yeah, it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that there's currently no way to really prevent the neuropathy from happening. Once it's been induced, you manage it with topicals and pharmaceuticals, as you mentioned. So this is truly a breakthrough technology, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, for sure. And, and this was the thing with neuropathy is once um, somebody has it in a chronic setting, that that's it. You know, it's, it's irreversible. Um, and so there's been um, a lot of people looking at this space. It's a really hot topic in terms of research at the moment. Um, so we're really excited to be part of that. And like you say, create um, a real breakthrough innovation that means that patients will be able to tolerate regimens for longer and have much better outcomes off the back of that. You are developing some really innovative technology, it sounds like. I'm sure it takes a village to do that. What type of team are you building to make all this a reality? So at Luminate, I'm really lucky to be surrounded by uh, an amazing team. Um, my co-founders, Dr. Barbara Oliveira, who's our, our CTO, and um, our, uh, our other co-founder, Professor Martin O'Halloran um, at the University of Galway, have been super supportive in terms of um, I suppose building building our team right from the start and it's really been an effort between the, the three of us to develop the technology develop the value prop and, and work with our clinical advisors to create something which we think will really um, change the way that patients interact with with cancer treatment um, and in the last uh, I suppose year since we've started to really scale up and enter our clinical phase uh, we've been able to build an incredible team around us, both in, in R&D and in regulatory and quality, um, and also on, on the clinical side where uh, we've got some amazing leaders in their fields um, and some, some really uh, promising talent, which is up and coming as well, um, who've gotten through a massive workload to bring us to the point where we're now bringing our Lily device to, to first in patient studies. You know, I was taking a look at your about me or about our company page. And I do notice that you are building a team of young, brilliant minds. So I am really looking forward to the things that you guys are gonna do over at Luminate. Yeah, I mean, the, the energy that we have in the group is, uh, is incredible. And I think I count myself super lucky to be surrounded by the team that we've got. And I think it's, it's fair to say, uh, we've got some really strong uh, people who are early in their career and have demonstrated a, a track record of excellence, but have so much room to grow. Um, but we've also complemented that with um, a lot of been there and done it before as well, even in terms of our chairperson, Trish Smith, and some of our, our senior managers have got a, a long career in medical devices um, behind them and ahead of them at this stage. Um, and so uh, I'm just really excited to be part of that team and feel really energized working alongside them. That's great. So maybe zooming out a little bit, where are you at in terms of the growth stage of your company? Yeah, for sure. So we're clinical stage right now. We're, uh, we're entering our first inpatient uh, clinical trials with the Lilly device. Uh, we've been doing some uh, healthy human volunteer data across the, the Lilac and the Lilly technologies for a while now. Um, and alongside that, we've kind of been doing our preclinical and working all the way back to idea stage. Um, as a company, we have our roots in the BioInnovate program at the, the University of Galway in Ireland, um, and that ultimately culminated um, in myself and my co-founder Barbara starting a uh, commercialization fund under the guidance of our other co-founder, Prof. Martin O'Halloran at the University of Galway. Um, and from there, that two-year project, or our task was really to build out um, a proof of concept for a technology to go after the, the hair loss need and ultimately you know, create an investable business off the back of that. Um, and probably I suppose the, some of the milestones we've had along the way were funded by Y Combinator in, in 2021, which was uh, a really interesting experience for us um, to kind of step outside maybe the pure um, med tech uh, focus. Um, and then, like you said, we've been able to fund um, some really impressive grants around the hair loss technology and more recently the, the neuropathy technology, which we uh, announced in November. So maybe focusing a little bit now on yourself, it's my understanding that you're a Teal Fellow. Could you talk a little bit about what that experience is like and what that's done for you as an entrepreneur, but also for your company? 
Yeah, no, I think the, the recognition of the Teal Fellowship has been, it was first of all a massive surprise, um, but uh, second of all, I think it, it's been quite powerful uh, for me personally, and then I think for us um, as a company, as a company, it's allowed us to move on some milestones in terms of the funding that was available to us. Um, and it's also provided us with some really um, interesting and unique connections that have allowed us to you know, develop more clinical contacts or um, you know, there are other fellows who are working on technologies which are helpful for us in terms of um, figuring out more about our devices and understanding them better. So it's been uh, really interesting there. But I think for me personally, it's been um, an incredible learning experience to connect with other fellows who are doing um, world changing things, both in healthcare and in other industries. Um, and I think the whole philosophy of the fellowship about, which is kind of, um, you know, we imagined a, a future which was flying cars and, and now we have 140 characters. Um, and for me, I suppose I imagine a future which is not about, you know, the jump from 140 to 280 characters on Twitter, but is more about, you know, can we help people to live um, better for longer after cancer treatment? And uh, the tagline we use is to completely change the face of, of cancer. And, and um, for me, that's the future I want to try and build. That's fantastic. What brings you to LSI? So I think for me, it's been a massive uh, opportunity to engage with the medtech community, both from a financing point of view, but also from looking at uh, partners in our value chain who can help us um, bring our products into the market. So for example, there are a lot of um, health systems who have their venture teams here, their innovation teams here. That's a really exciting opportunity for us to say, listen, we've got something uh, in the pipeline here which we think is really exciting. We've already got some pretty uh, large US-based hospital systems on board for our next stage studies with Lilly and in early interest in Lilac as well. So that's a really exciting um, opportunity for us. And really what we're trying to set out as a platform for us as a, as a company as you move from uh, our clinical stage now, hopefully in the near term future to commercialization, looking at partners who can support us in doing that. You're a European company. What are the odds we find you at Barcelona in September? I think they're they're pretty strong. We're looking at um, a financing round at some point in the near term future. Um, you know, that's... Uh, Ultimately, our aim is to scale into the, the US and European markets in pretty short order and start impacting patients. Um, so I suppose keep for, for the audience to keep their eyes out, uh, we might be available at that point. You know, you teased out a product there that sounds like it's in your pipeline, but I think we'll have to table that for a discussion in the next time you and I meet. Yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, there's a lot of work happening in the background, and uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that we're really lucky to be part of uh, an innovation ecosystem in the University of Galway that gives us access to some first-class researchers. Um, and so, yeah, there's some interesting stuff in the pipeline, which uh, hopefully in a few months we'll be able to talk a little bit more about. That is definitely exciting. I look forward to following the things you're doing over Illuminate. Thank you so much for joining me, Aaron. Thanks, Nick.